Okay, I guess we're... Okay, we're going to get started with the webinar. My name is Kathy Whiting. I'm from Limnotech. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining this webinar on the use of nearshore monitoring buoys in the Great Lakes. We have over 200 people registered for this, um, and most of the group being from the Great Lakes area. We also have a good mix of folks from um, different areas, government organizations, universities, nonprofits, and some individual companies. Um, first, I'm going to go over some of the go-to meeting items. So what you see here is the attendee interface um, with the presentation window and the toolbar, and you can mac maximize your window just like you would with any uh, regular window. You can also expand and collapse the toolbar using the orange arrow. Um, there's also the box to view and select your audio, which I'll talk about a little more in a minute. And then you can submit questions using this chat box. Uh, please submit your questions as they come up using this chat box. We're, we are going to try to answer one or two questions after each presentation as time permits, and then we also should have time at the end um, for a few more questions. Questions that we can't get to today during the webinar, we'll answer directly uh, via email. And then lastly, everyone should be on mute. For the audio, um, here's the audio section of the toolbar. You have two options, one to use your computer speakers and the other is to use the telephone. If you want to use the telephone, you should dial in using the number on your screen um, and then the, the uh, pin on your screen and then you should be connected and you can adjust the volume. Um, Nearshore monitoring buoys are a relatively low-cost way to provide real-time data on marine conditions to a variety of users, and our objective with this webinar is to show how users can increase access to this real-time data. There are a lot of different types of monitoring buoys. This is just a few examples that I've shown up here. But there are, are a number of different options besides the examples that we are going to be talking about today in the different presentations. Here's an overview of um, our agenda for the webinar. First, we're going to have Don Wire from S2 Yachts talking about the Titus buoy, and then we'll have Dr. Guy Meadows from the University of Michigan, Dr. Robert Shuckman from Michigan Tech Research Institute, and Ed Verhaby from Limnotech talking about specific applications. We also have Sarah Maples from Gloss, and she'll be giving us an overview of data management and communication. And then Greg Peterson from Linotech will wrap things up. And then, like I said, we hope to have some time for questions at the end. We will also be recording this webinar, and we will be sending out the link for everyone to access the, the, um, the webinar. We'll be emailing that to everyone on Monday. I think that's everything and now I'm going to turn it over to Don Weyer. Thank you Kathy. Um, like she said my name is Don Weyer and I work for a company in West Michigan called S2 Yachts. Um, we um, have had the pleasure of being involved in uh, the Great Lakes Observing System um, a fair amount um, with the design of our buoy. Um, S2 is uh, largely known uh, around the world as Tierra Yachts. Um, this is what we do. We build high quality, very durable uh, products for the severe marine environments um, all around the world. Um, here's a couple of uh, our other products, the Tierra Yachts, and we're also manufacturers of pursuit fishing boats as well. Um, back in March of 2009, we uh, had an opportunity to collaborate with the Ocean Engineering Lab at the University of Michigan. Um, the OEL uh, lab had um, some frustration with buoy equipment that was available. It's um, 
price and lack of fr uh, flexibility primarily. Um, they sought our help in uh, helping out with a platform. So <clears throat> the, uh, uh, we uh, took that opportunity to design a buoy for coastal monitoring um, and that's turned into an enterprise for us to partake in. Uh, the design objectives for the uh, Titus 900 is operational efficiency. Um, it's a high value, high quality, very durable uh, buoy that requires very little maintenance and is very flexible um, for configuration and reconfiguration uh, from season to season. Um, this is a picture of the Titus 900. Um, it's about a meter in diameter. Um, I'm not going to get too terribly deep into a lot of specifics, just a general overview um, about the buoy. Um, first and foremost, I'll mention here that um, solar panels, uh, solar charge controller, and 24-hour amp-hour battery are um, part of the standard equipment. Um, as we carry on, I will scroll through um, basic buoy anatomy for the Titus 900 um, in a top-down approach, starting at the very top. Um, again, keep in mind a lot of the technology will be discussed by other presenters. Um, I'm just giving a basic overview of our equipment. Um, starting with the mast, um, it is a one single piece welded aluminum anodized mast um, of our design. It features a uh, integrated radar reflector, um, lots of provisions for cabling, um, and uh, the yard arms you see here are uh, of an oval cross section, which makes it very easy to clamp and mount meteorological instruments um, in a very secure way. Um, also standard on the buoy is a two-mile um, beacon light that is, that is uh, self-contained and um, solar charged and has its own battery isolated from the, the buoy's electrical system. The mast is um, attached to what we call the electrical housing immediately below the mast. Uh, here's three of them laying on their side. Um, inside, the, uh, in, inside the electronics housing is the, a NEMA enclosure that comes with the buoy. Um, it's very similar in size and proportion to the one you see here. Um, you can also see this is one of two of the, the gaskets that um, seal the top uh, or the, the electronics housing to the main buoy body. Uh, here's an inside view of the electronics housing and we mount our NEMA enclosure on a, a removable panel that makes uh, on the water service possible from a small boat. Um, moving downward a little further uh, into the main buoy body, we're looking at the top of the deck here. Um, which has three of the six solar panels on it. Um, the pass-through feature is something that uh, we added um, due to feedback from some of our collaborators that they were looking for a, a clever way to mount um, surface instrumentation uh, within the buoy um, that would be uh, protected by the, the buoy's perimeter. Um, you can see this large uh, black extrusion, extrusion around the outside of the buoy um, it's, a, it's about an inch and a half thick, and that protects uh, buoy from impact and so on. Um, the pass-through feature is just what it is called. It's a, a vertical tube that passes through the main buoy body, and there are three of them. Um, this photo is only showing one, um, but it can be used for, like I said, housing near-surface uh, instrumentation or managing the cabling for below-surface uh, instrumentation. Uh, the pass-through also works nicely for um, a variety of things, and this particular client um, has a RBR temperature string logger mounted in, in one of his pass-throughs. This photo also shows the top of the, or what I'll call the, the top of the buoy, but the bottom of the, um, of the electronics housing, and then there's the other gasket, and this is access to the buoy tube, or the battery tube and the main wire harness that uh, routes out of there. We also have a uh, what we call an instrument carriage option um, available for that can be adapted to a variety of surface instrumentation. Um, it, it 
consists of this white tube here that is current in this view uh, is housing a Nortec ADCP. Um, from the top of the buoy, this past the, uh, the instrument carriage lifts out, and then you can also see conveniently located a, uh, a, the uh, cable outlet for this instrument to be plugged into the main buoy body. Um, this view also shows the, um, the, the I, I'll call it a toggle bolt. It's a bolt that swings out of the way for um, releasing the top of the uh, electronics housing um, and breaking down the buoy into its subcomponents. Here's uh, the Titus 900 buoy hull. Um, that This is a view that not many people get to see. <laughs> this is before the, the deck goes on, before the top goes on. Um, the buoy is fiberglass, um, and the, uh, this main column here passes all the way through the buoy. That is the central ballast tube. All of these tubes, including the pass-through tubes, which it's hard to see the third one here, is, uh, they're all a filament-wound composite material, very durable, um, and makes for a really uh, tough, rigid structure. Um, and then after we install the deck over the top of the buoy, we uh, ensure that it is airtight, and then we also fill this uh, cavity with foam uh, for a buoyancy preservation. Um, one of the things about the buoy that I think is worth pointing out is that it is fiberglass. There's very little metal uh, to be concerned with uh, for corrosion, et cetera. Um, it's also therefore not magnetic and uh, doesn't offer any interference with compasses and so on. The bottom of the ballast tube uh, is our mooring bale. This is a silicon bronze uh, weldment of our design. Um, it is protected with zinc anodes to protect against corrosion regardless of fresh or salt water. And then here we have our um, modular ballast rings. Um, our ballast can be configured in a variety of ways based on your application. Um, and then we also use this large uh, ship link chain as a uh, ballast supplement. The buoy is not a very large diameter, so it gets its stability from, uh, from a low center of gravity. We do offer a um, trailer option, which makes for a very uh, simple transport and uh, storage of the buoy. Um, here's an example of that. I like to tell people that this trailer is grad student proof. Um, so application for that certificate certification was uh, was not easy to get, but there it is. Um, so that's the Titus buoy on a trailer. Um, here's one hanging in our shop um, that's nearly complete uh, for a client. This was done in uh, one of last year's uh, production batch. We are getting ready to produce another batch uh, very shortly. And if you have further questions, I'm glad to take those um, and, of course, supply as much information as I can for you. Okay, thanks, Don. We did have a question about how tall is the mast and how far above the water surface is it? That's one of those many numbers that I don't memorize, so I'll refer to my cheat sheet. Um, <laughs> the height of the, 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 the mast reaches about three meters above water line, and uh, the, buoy, the buoy is, like I said, um, just a little bit over a meter in diameter. So that's uh, one of the basic numbers. And I have a, a fact sheet I can send you to if you'd like to drop us an email or let me know. Okay, great. Thanks, Don. Um, oh. Okay, and now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Guy Meadows from the University of Michigan. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, the Ocean Engineering Lab at the University of Michigan has been involved for almost 30 years now in developing environmental monitoring platforms, uh, primarily for the Great Lakes and coastal oceans. Um, GLOSS, G-L-O-S, the Great Lakes Observing System, is that entity within the Great Lakes that represents the integrated ocean observing system, which is uh, nationwide to provide oceanographic measurements and large lake measurements here in the Great Lakes of environmental parameters that will help make informed 
decisions by communities and decision makers. Um, our little part of the world we've called the Upper Great Lakes Observing System, and that concentrates primarily in the uh, northern part of the Great Lakes, as you'll see, and other universities are actively doing very similar things throughout uh, the entire basin. We began in uh, northern Lake Michigan and Grand Traverse Bay in 2008, uh, deploying the first of the Ugloss buoys. Uh, in 2009, we added a, a, uh, the first Titus buoy in that region and continued to develop the network with a whole series of, of partners. Uh, we partner with Michigan Tech University, that you'll hear from Dr. Shuckman shortly, up in Lake Superior on either side of the Keweenaw. We partner with Limnotech in Southern Lake Michigan. And I think the real secret to the success of the growth of the buoy network, uh, in addition to federal interest, has been in developing these very strong partnerships with local communities as well as with uh, S2 Yachts in terms of manufacturing the buoys and with our other university partners. And in terms of those partners, you just heard from Don Wire from S2. Uh, we're very proud of that partnership and we're very proud how the uh, Titus 900 buoy has evolved to be a very versatile platform. And I'll talk a fair bit about some of that versatility and why certain measurements are being made routinely. Uh, our other partners include a whole variety of folks uh, around Little Traverse Bay and Grand Traverse Bay. Our most recent addition to the Upper Great Lakes Network has been offshore of the Ludington area and again we have partnerships there that have, have developed primarily as a result of intense interest by the charter boat fishing community in that region and great support from the, the city in terms of sponsoring the buoys. Uh, Limnotech has brought a partnership with the power generation industry that again is a, uh, another avenue where uh, automated real-time measurements are critically important. The Great Lakes Universities are all part of this network. The first uh, large inland lake buoy went in uh, last uh, two years ago at the University of Michigan's biological station at Felston. So that buoy is located on Douglas Lake and as I say represents the first uh, addition of a coastal ocean type buoy to an inland uh, lake environment. That has worked out extremely well. We are strong partners with the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory of NOAA and with the National Weather Service throughout the Great Lakes regions who again use these buoys for a number of model developments and forecasting applications. Uh, most recently National Park Service has been very interested so that brings in addition the Department of Interior and the Coast Guard relies on these buoys for search and rescue operations and for planning their, their daily operations. As I said, I think the, the premier partnership has been with the uh, initial design of the buoy occurring at the university, but then as the buoy program uh, evolved, we firmly believe that universities ought to be involved in research and science, and the manufacturing ought to be turned over to the real professionals. So through the university, we transferred that technology to S2 Yachts and in Holland, and the product that they have, have created has been extremely reliable and extremely beneficial to the overall program and uh, just a hazard to guess I think by the end of this year there will be some 14 or 15 of those deployed throughout the Great Lakes with a couple of going to Alaska and and they're starting to uh, their popularity is starting to grow. In terms of some of the the details uh, as the Great Lakes universities got together and decided what was required to be measured for the Great Lakes Observing System, a whole series of requirements uh, came out of those meetings and were transferred to, to S2 Yachts. But essentially each of these buoys that are part of the GLOSS network measure incident solar radiation, wind speed, wind direction, wind gusts, air temperature, relative humidity, barometric pressure, uh, if they're equipped with an acoustic Doppler current profiler, then they measure the flow of the water beneath the buoys uh, uh, from the surface all the way down to the bottom, and those measurements are, are corrected for the motions of the buoy itself. Um, these buoys mostly contain the Ocean Engineering Lab 
inertial wave sensor, which in addition to providing wave height and wave period, supplies the wave direction. And that's a very complicated process. The reason to go to that uh, extreme difficulty is the new operational wave plan for the coastal oceans and Great Lakes requires all new wave sensors to measure the direction uh, of the wave's approach uh, in terms of what is called the first five Fourier components. Uh, these buoys meet that new requirement and, and that will be the standard uh, going forward into the future. Um, one of the pass-throughs that Don Weyer uh, spoke about was the uh, ability to put a YSI uh, uh, or similar type of uh, water quality multi-probe in one of those pass-throughs. The, the buoys have been designed and integrated to accept a whole variety of these types of standard sensors. So if one were to do that, then that whole list of water quality parameters becomes instantly available on the buoy. So dissolved oxygen, blue-green algae, turbidity, chlorophyll, temperature, depth, conductivity, pH. We have also developed a uh, thermistor temperature string to suspend below the bu buoys, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But I think what is what is critical at this point is our buoys are set up to report all of these measurements once every 10 minutes, and uh, that information goes directly to the Great Lakes Observing website, which you'll hear about uh, in the later part of the presentation, directly to National Weather Service, uh, and directly back here to the university for, for display and archiving. So they're very capable little uh, little soldiers out there. Uh, again, these are the, the current locations of, of the buoys that, that we affectionately call the Upper Great Lakes Observing System. We were able with Michigan Tech University to add a buoy on the south side of the Keweenaw Peninsula in last year uh, and one off Ludington. 2012, uh, there probably will not be any new university buoys uh, entered along the coastal region, which again speaks very strongly to the need to develop far-reaching partnerships. Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory of NOAA does uh, twice daily numerical predictions of, of wave heights throughout the Great Lakes. Uh, this is a comparison of the Great Lakes coastal forecasting wave predictions uh, for the location of the Little Traverse Bay buoy are uh, NDBC number 45022. Uh, and you can see throughout the entire season the red marks, the, the red lines are the numerical predictions of wave height and the black lines superimposed over that are the buoy recorded measurements. And uh, again, the, I think you'll agree that the buoy does an excellent job of comparing to the, to the numerical predictive models. We think the buoys are, are very accurate and if you Paying very close attention, you'll see some of these major storm events uh, had wave heights, significant wave heights over five meters. So there are some very big waves out here in the Great Lakes, and uh, we, most of us on the webinar here, realize that very, very intensely. So uh, the buoys have gone through many storms uh, of this magnitude uh, throughout their duration, and we have not had a single uh, structural failure in any of the buoys. A little bit on the uh, thermistor string uh, that, again, just plugs and plays through the, uh, through the buoy. Uh, it is capable of supporting up to 16 nodes. We typically do eight nodes. Uh, each one is independent and supplies, again, once every 10 minutes, a measurement of the water temperature at the depth of each of those nodes. And as the little diagram on the far right indicates, uh, we try to get that bottom node very close to the bottom so that you're getting a true indication of the water temperatures throughout the entire water column. This is done, again, as part of one of the gloss requirements, which is that uh, that to a significant portion of the U.S. and Canadian population drink the water here in the Great Lakes, and that structure, the thermal structure within the water column is extremely important to, to water quality for drinking water, taste, odor, essential. And, uh, it provides a, a very good indication of, of those types of, of measurements. The buoys that do not have the thermistor string on them as are depicted on the left hand, hand side here of the diagram. It makes the mooring a little bit simpler, uh, but with the thermistor string uh, to the bottom, as I say, there's a little counterweight right here at the bottom that uh, 
that acts to keep the thermistor straight and vertical. Um, we've had some issues with that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And the fact that it's so close to the bottom, as Mother Nature would indicate, it's uh, very. If, if something can go wrong, it will. And uh, we've had some tangling issues with our mooring. Uh, that has call, caused a couple of our buoys this year, never before, but something special this year, uh, to break loose of their moorings and go wandering off on their own. And the Coast Guard has been very helpful in terms of recovering those, and our partners have been extremely, extremely uh, helpful in recovering those. So having excellent community partners, uh, I can't say enough about. Uh, in summary, um, there are many types of partners, and I encourage you that are interested in, in supporting a buoy activity to, to look to your partners with, with great care. Um, they are very willing and able. Uh, they bring a great deal to the table, and they all have different goals in mind. Uh, but in general, the buoys add to local communities an increase in commerce, a tremendous increase in, in water safety, the ability to, to know what the conditions are before you leave the dock. Uh, in particular, in the Little Traverse Bay and Grand Traverse Bay area, we, we have many testimonials about the, the benefit to the commerce of the local communities, which depend on safe access to the water, how, how that has benefited the, the communities themselves. They provide automated environmental data, as I say, once every 10 minutes. Each buoy uh, collects between 1 and 2 million data points a year, uh, and it does so totally automated with almost no human intervention. Uh, they also provide a foundation for sound, uh, informed decision making. Uh, much of our coastline here in Michigan, people depend very strongly on not only access to the water, but that the water is clean and safe, and uh, the buoys provide that uh, the ability to make good decisions. As some examples uh, for Grand Traverse Bay, which is our longest enduring partnership, here are some of the, the folks involved. Uh, Great Lakes Water Study Institute, uh, Elmer's Concrete actually supplied the concrete uh, anchors for the for the uh, for the buoys. Uh, Great Lakes Maritime Academy, Michigan State Extension Service, Michigan Sea Grant, the Great Lakes Observing System, DTE Energy, and a national program called the Alliance for Coastal Technologies, and tremendous support also from the Native community in, in that area. And as I say, there are, are two, uh, two buoys in Grand Traverse Bay, one in the South Bay just off the, or in West Arm off the city, and the other at the mouth of the bay north of the Mission Peninsula. And similarly, in, in Little Traverse Bay, uh, again, tremendous across-the-board support. Uh, really like to thank the, the cities of Petoskey, Charlevoix, and, and Harbor Springs for their active participation. Uh, Irish Boat Shop, Walshman's Marine, S2 Yachts, Bay Harbor have all played major roles in terms of not only making the buoy possible, but actually providing real in-kind support to, to our activities. If something goes out in the buoy, uh, we could simply, rather than making a five-hour trip up with a boat each way from Ann Arbor, we could simply send the part up there and they'll run out and swap it out. And uh, This buoy did break loose from its mooring this year in a big storm and it was too rough for the Coast Guard to go out and save the buoy, but our partners went out and saved the buoy. So you can't say any more than that about uh, what great partners we have. Be glad to answer questions, uh, but again, from the university perspective, uh, developing these partnerships and having this buoy network grow has been a, a tremendous thing to be a partner of and a part of, and it's something that we hope continues on into the future. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Guy. I want to encourage everybody to continue sending in questions. Um, but for Dr. Meadows, we had a question about. Um, the other lakes, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, if you have done any work there? Um, we have not, but again, part of the GLOSS Great Lakes Observing System Network has partners in both Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. You'll hear a little bit more about that uh, later on. And uh, there are uh, presently now three buoys down in, in those ends of lakes on the U.S. side that are, are part of the GLOSS network. And, and keep in mind, these buoys are designed to 
complement and add to what the federal government and the Canadian government is doing in the center parts of the basin with the National Data Buoy Center buoys. We've actually configured our website so it identically mirrors the NDBC website so that if you're familiar with using that, then switching to the coastal buoys is, is it will look exactly the same to you, but provide more detail and again, we make measurements every 10 minutes because things change very rapidly in the coastal zones and people need that type of, of, uh, of high resolution and, and very short time period data to make intelligent decisions. Great, thank you very much. And now I want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Robert Schuckman from the Michigan Tech Research Institute. Um, thank you and uh, good morning also. Um, I'm going to talk about the Lake Superior Water Monitoring and Information System and it's our intent to uh, generate long-term water quality meteorological and wave parameter measurements in Lake Superior. Um, as you can see on this summary slide, this is truly a collaborative effort with folks in, in my institute at Michigan Tech Research Institute in, in Ann Arbor, as well as uh, university participants in Houghton, as well as Professor Meadows. Um, and why are we doing this? Well, we're supporting the four priority issues outlined by the uh, GLOSS system. Uh, climate change impacts, ecosystem and food web dynamics, protection of public health, and certainly navigation safety and efficiency. And of course, each of these buoys, as has been discussed earlier today, the recreational boaters and commercial fishermen and certainly the Coast Guard from a search and rescue perspective, uh, they all like the buoys as do uh, the GLORO in respect to the Great Lakes Coastal Forecasting System and the uh, uh, Weather Service. Um, our, our buoys also support aspects of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, in particular looking at legacy mining issues, for example, like the Gay Stamp Sand facility. Um, where, uh, public awareness is, is also uh, an issue that we're uh, working with the buoys on. Um, what, what we did at Tech um, we, we certainly did not have a lot of experience in wave measurements and we really capitalized off the U of M experience as Professor Meadows identified as well as the wonderful job S2 Bowie did in providing this package and, and that truly let us hit the ground running with these buoys so that we could um, deploy them quickly. Uh, we took advantage of their mooring expertise, their deployment expertise, and again, their high quality cost effective instrumentation. Well, at that point, we're, we're now leveraging off that acquired technology and we're already used technical work noodling with the, the buoys with power improvement. We're going to a third generation wave sensor, again in partnership with um, University of Michigan. We have a new approach in parallel with the thermistor, that uh, um, eight node thermistor chain that, that Guy uh, described. We're going to a single wire, uh, one meter incremental thermistor that we think if, if it pans out this summer, could be a very cost effective addition to the to the S2 technology. And because we're in Lake Superior, 
cell phone coverage is problematic in places. Um, we're also um, running an Iridium communication link with the buoy so that we can move to very, very remote areas. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about our funding, and it certainly is funded by GLOSS, but, but the university has, uh, through our uh, VP of Research, his Infrastructure Enhancement Award, we put money in from my institute. But we also have cooperative arrangements with the National Park Service, for example, them giving us access to the, to the ranger, which I'll talk about in a minute, as well as use of their barge for deployment and, and, and uh, removal of the buoy at the uh, end of the uh, season. We're also uh, working on an endowment to fund these buoys beyond GLOSS uh, funding. Um, very busy but important slide at this point. This, this summarizes our instrumentation. We have two moored buoys, one at the north and south entrance of the Keweenaw Waterway. They, of course, measure the weather condition, the wave dynamics, water quality, currents, temperature profiles. We have a set of what we call eye buttons. These are the same buttons used in the uh, uh, shipping of commercial fish. We've put waterproof sensors on them. They record all summer at both the north and south end of the channel. And then we have a, a ferry box system that, that operates every time the ranger goes out to Isle Royal National Park two times a week, we get the transit out and the transit back. Those are all autonomous systems. You can read the details under the north buoy. We call that super buoy because that has an ADCP, uh, acoustic Doppler current profiler. It has a YSI at approximately 10 meters. Um, we, we do solar radiation PAR on that one, as well as the full up MET and waves. Um, our south buoy is the more basic buoy that does MET. It does do uh, full solar radiation and PAR, as well as waves. And, and, a, uh, uh, and thermal profiling, but, but we don't have the ADCP or, or YSI. The Ranger system is essentially a YSI 6600 that has been taken apart, and, and, and we sample water through the, the water chest in the uh, engine room and, and take measurements every half minute during the transit. And that data is automatically downloaded when the uh, ranger comes back and the crew gets on the internet. We have a wireless system on, on the uh, ranger 3 to transmit data back automatically. Um, just a little quick summary. I don't think I need to dwell long on this, but, uh, but both buoys were, were deployed. We, we did QAQC which is, again, an important aspect of this thing, three times at each buoy. The ranger runs, uh, the ferry box runs throughout the season, and then the eye buttons we put in in early April and remove them in October. Um, I am a remote sensing guy, uh, so I had to have at least one thermal image. This is sharing with you an upwelling event, the, the Yellow colors, the brighter colors, or the hotter colors. There's a legend here, but this captured a classic upwelling, and you can see red dots where the locations of the buoys are. The real importance of this is we have found now that, that these buoys that are making continuous time series measurements at one spot, when they're merged, fused with the synoptic satellite pictures, the amount of information one can gleam at that point of, of the processes going on, the forcing functions, as well as the lifetime of these very important upwelling events is, is improved tenfold at least. Um, 
Again, here are our upgrades for, for the buoy as we move forward. Um, I've really talked about these. Um, we are going to actually a, a nine degree of freedom wave sensor. We think that's going to give us more research grade wave information along with what supports the uh, recreational boating community. Just an example of a time series of our upwelling events. I'm showing, pointing out with arrows, but it's, uh, as you can see on the, uh, on the scale here, the over as short as 8 to 14 hours, we're getting 4 degrees C temperature changes. And again, having a buoy at the north and south entrance of the Keweenaw, that gives us a lot of insight into the water exchange and the SACE action in, in Lake Superior. And really, prior to these buoys, with the exception of the good work done at University of Michigan, I'm sorry, University of Minnesota Duluth, there were very few coastal observations in, in Lake Superior. Extremely useful and helpful. Here's an example of what we get four times a week, Tuesdays and Saturdays, from the Ranger 3 as it, trans, uh, uh, as it transits out taking, frankly, uh, uh, visitors out to Isle Royal um, from the Keweenaw Waterway. I'm just giving you an example of turbidity, temperature, conductivity, wind speed, we do chlorophyll and uh, uh, dissolved oxygen as well. But again, very, very useful data because it repeats the same location over and over again. We're, we're now talking to the Park Service about adding some more atmospheric um, measuring devices like um, um, a CO2 sensor. How do we share this data? Well. Um, we push data. Um, that's our approach at Tech. So, so, and and frankly, at University of Michigan, and 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 the Cook results you'll hear as well. So, the buoys every 10 minutes, right now through a a uh, modem Viridian uh, 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 based pumps data out to various websites, and and our main delivery site for, for our uh, um, observations are the first one listed really, michigantechlakesuperior.org. The data also is, is sent near simultaneously to, to the uh, National Data Buoy Center. It also gets shared with uh, Professor Meadows' ocean engineering site and also ends up at GLOSS. It will also end up in the new GLOSS DMAX site as well. And, and, and we have a lot of visualization tools. They're compatible with major browsers, as indicated here. This is just a screenshot of popping out last 24-hour data of either the buoy or the ranger. Extremely useful. We also can pop out, for example, this shows an upwelling event from the uh, uh, thermistor chain that that Guy described previously. Um, we use Django as our guiding um, uh, data approach. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, we start with raw data. It goes into these open source Django database. It then goes into a server that then gets pulled by users. And why have we gone to this approach? It's scalable, it's transferable to many data um, uh, users, and, and we're not going to all of a sudden, if we add three more buoys, have to go into a redesign of the system. Um, to conclude, the data collected are presently used to support uh, commercial fishing. They, they, pro they provide inputs in the models and, and really validation of our remote sensing products. We're, we really like combining these single location time series data with the remote sensing observations and then the, the Great Lakes coastal forecasting model uh, 
extremely useful in, in for example, um, quantifying the upwelling events. Um, we also like the buoy platforms because, again, S2 had wonderful insight in terms of letting us have additional portals for uh, hanging experimental sensors that, as a research university, we can create and then literally plug and play with them within the S2 framework. And again, I encourage people to go to our Lake Superior Water Monitoring and Information System. Again, I'm showing you there. That's where all the data is housed at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Um, you, do you want to take a minute and talk a little bit about how you handle the data QA, QC with the data that you're collecting? Uh, yes, and, and as we all know, uh, the audience out there, QA, QC, the $64 question, or the infinite sink of time and money. Um, we, we do a couple of things on QA, QC. We, we certainly bound the, the sensible values that a given in-situ sensor should produce, and if we exceed that range, we, we don't share that right away, we flag that data for later use. For example, the, for the YSIs, they're pre-calibrated prior to deployment. We, we then um, sample with, with a, a ship-based YSI, we compare those, and then when the YSI comes out at the end of the year, we compare the initial to the final cal calibration, and then correct the databases before we share them. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Bob. And uh, next we're going to have Ed Verhamey from Limnotech. Thanks, Kathy. Um, today I'll be talking about our buoy application um, on Lake Michigan. Uh, we are working for the Cook Nuclear Power Plant, um, which is uh, which is between St. Joe, Michigan, and New Buffalo on the southeastern shore of Lake Michigan. Um, I just want to point out that at the Cook Power Plant, if you've never seen it um, from the water, there's the uh, Grand Muir State Park to the north and the Warren Dunes State Park to the south. So just a beautiful, beautiful area, sand dunes. Um, and this next slide here just kind of shows uh, how the nuclear power plant kind of wedged in between the sand dunes. Um, and you see the two reactors. Uh, one thing that's unique about this plant is you don't see any any cooling towers or you know, big like Homer Simpson, uh, you know, cooling towers. Um, all you see is uh, a large building, two reactors, and uh, a set of power lines running from it. So very, very low, uh, lo low impact on the surrounding area. Um, in this picture, you can see where the water intake is and where the discharge is. This is a once-through cooling plant, so that's why you don't see the cooling towers. Um, and you know, because it's a once-through cooling plant, um, they, they they really need to understand how the lake is operating, um, what what the temperatures are, uh, because the more they know about the lake, that'll transfer into more efficiency for them. Um, they're also required to have an understanding of the physical and biological environment uh, for the discharge permits uh, for the for the state and and the EPA, um, and also for our project, uh, we had a need. Um, uh, to understand the wave heights and the wind speed uh, for the offshore health and safety um, of these offshore crews that, that would be working. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the approach, um, our approach, um, to understand some of the physical stuff uh, was to deploy um, a, a whole bunch of temperature sensors. Uh, we had velocity meters out there, and these were at multiple locations. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that data today, but I, I'm going to talk more about the real-time buoy. So we uh, decided to use a real-time buoy at one of the stations, which was measuring a whole suite of parameters. Um, and so when we were uh, early on in the project trying to decide, you know, why, why do we need a real-time buoy? And the, re the real turning point for us was, uh, was all of the offshore work that, that, that would be happening and all the crews. So in this picture here, you, you see a jack-up arch um, that was doing some um, offshore drilling to um, understand the subsurface geology. And so there was a crew of uh, six people going out every day for several months. And so 
for the health and safety reasons, they needed to know what the wave height was locally and at a high frequency. So, the, so that was a real decision point for us on why, why to go real time. Um, the other reason was that the, that the plan itself was really interested in knowing in, you know, in, in near real time what the lake conditions were. So the thermal, structural, the thermal structure of the lake was, was important to them. Um, so we deployed a real time buoy. Um, it, it was deployed two and a half miles from shore in 70 feet of water. Um, it had a basic set of sensors on it, um, most of which uh, has already been talked about, so I won't go into detail. And you know, I, you know, again, I just wanted to point out that the buoy is reporting every every 10 minutes, uh, which which is a huge advantage, um, as as Guy mentioned in the boating world, that you know, an hour is a pretty long time if you're trying to make a decision, and uh, you know, 10 minutes um, is is much higher frequency. Here, here's just some pictures of our um, of our deployment. So we used our boat to deploy the buoy. Um, we used the uh, jacket barge to help us deploy our mooring. Um, and you see there on the left. And then the buoy, as uh, Don pointed out, was transported very easily on a trailer. The primary um, data access priorities for the buoy, the, the uh, our, our number one goal with data coming from the buoy was to have it available for AEP and the offshore work and the on-site work. So we, um, so we utilized Guy's website for that. Our, our second priority was to be able to share the data with other users. So we, we were sending the data to the National Data Buoy Center, where it was accessed by the National Weather Service, by the, by the Coast Guard, by the Sheriff, by the fishermen. Um, and we're also sharing it with the Great Lakes Observing System, um, being a, you know, going into their network as well. Um, our, our third priority was you know, to make sure the data that we were sending to all these groups was, was of high quality. So we had some hard-coded stuff that was in, in the buoy software itself. Uh, we were also doing some manual QA, QC checks where we just kind of watch the data um, every so often, check it every day, once a week. Um, and then we also relied on others to watch the QA, QC for us. So you know, because our contact information was out there with the NDBC and, and um, at, uh, at the U of M website, they were able to send us an email uh, when they saw something that was up. Um, here's just a sample of some of the data coming from the buoy. Like I said, our main reason for going with this buoy is the wave height data. And so you can see why um, or how fast uh, wave heights can change um, on Lake Michigan. These are some of the fall events that, that came through this year. The one in particular I wanted to point out was uh, you know, within a matter of an hour or two, the wave height went from less than a foot to almost 10 feet. And so for a boater, um, that's very critical, um, knowing that information. I also wanted to point out, uh, for an event that happened in the summertime, uh, what the offshore buoy was showing. So that's shown here in the gray line um, as their hourly wave height measurements, as, and the black line is what our buoy was recording near shore. So this was a fast moving storm cell um, that, that didn't really hit the middle of the lake, but you see how you know, within 20 minutes the wave height was uh, close to four feet. So just having that local real time data um, you know, available to our team and then also to other people. Um, Guy, Guy showed this comparison, but I just wanted to also show that for our buoy in Southern Lake Michigan that the NOAA wave model um, um, was accurately predicting the wave heights, you know, and I will point out that this is the this is their nowcast model, so it uses um, um, actual wind speeds and conditions, and, and so it's more of a hindcast prediction. They they have a forecast model that looks out into the future, uh, but again, um, you know, people know that that the forecasts um, change and conditions change, and so this model wouldn't be as accurate. You know, or the comparison wouldn't be as good as if we were looking at the forecast conditions several days out. Um, but you know, the model is a useful tool. There are um, many spots on the Great Lakes where the buoys aren't there, and so people could look to use the model data in place of buoy data. Um, and we're working on some tools uh, right now to make that uh, more easy or easier. Um, this is a plot of kind of the, the a fall turnover event with our water temperature data. So you can see the, the red line is our surface temperature, the black line is our bottom temperature, and you can see how stratified the water column was 
and then a large wind event move through. Um, and so for a fisherman, this would be very important data, knowing that they're going to have to go much further from shore in order to get below, uh, below the thermocline. This is just a sample plot of our water velocity data. So for the uh, uh, surface currents, um, is shown on the top line. The middle of the water column is shown, and then the bottom currents. So you can see how fast these surface currents react to the wind, um, change direction, and sometimes they were even going in a different direction um, than the bottom currents. So for a physical modeler, this is very, you know, very important data to kind of show how the internal workings of the lake are going and how the currents are moving and, uh, you know, interacting. Uh, I just wanted to point out some, uh, some, some quotes that we've received throughout the year from users. Um, we, from uh, John Taylor at the National Weather Service. Um, you know, I'm not going to read the quotes, but you know, there's a lot of people who were sending us uh, you know, specific emails making sure that we knew how valuable the data was to them. Um, so we had surfers. Um, you know, I didn't know that there was a huge surfing community in the Great Lakes, and I know uh, Bob and Guy have had similar experience uh, where they're really looking for that wave height data. Um, and also the local fishermen, you know, they were, they were happy to blog about it on their forums. They were talking about it. They were telling other people. Um, you know, and just when we were going around town in St. Joe, uh, just having the name on our truck, uh, you know, everyone knew that we were the buoy people. So they'd ask us all the time. Everyone said, oh, you're the buoy people. So, it, you know, it was amazing how fast word spread. Once, once that data point was out there. And then also our project manager here, um, here at Limnotech who's working in that offshore drilling team. So, uh, you know, she had said that, uh, that it was almost, you know, it was an invaluable tool for them. Uh, just, just some of the lessons learned. Um, you know, the original goal wasn't to, to send the buoy uh, to all these other places. But, you know, we found that, you know, if you build it, so to say, if you put it out there, that you know, that the users will find it um, as long as it's available through the regular um, data streams. Um, you know, and we found that the local people um, started relying on the buoy uh, more than the other sources that they were used to. So they'd always check the buoy first. Uh, you know, um, we were lucky in that our buoy wasn't down at all this year. We didn't have any problems. It was up from uh, May, or I'm sorry, from June all the way until the end of October. Um, and it, you know, and it trumps, you know, and it really trumps uh, some of the other sources of data that, that people have access to. And, you know, for us, for a private buoy being deployed, um, the costs were very reasonable. Um, it wasn't significantly more expensive than using a non-real-time buoy. And the labor savings alone for that offshore drilling team almost paid for the, you know, paid for any cost difference. So the time savings of not going out when they, when they couldn't go out. And with that, I'll... Uh, Take any questions? And I wanted to thank uh, Guy Meadows and the National Weather Service for helping us uh, with the buoy and watching data quality. Um, thanks, Ed. Did you have any type of uh, GPS tracking on your on your buoy system? Uh, we did that first. Um, you know, we had more of these pretty well, and then as Guy had talked about, um, you know, the uh, currents in the Great Lakes just really wrap these buoys right around the mooring. Um, that these are circular currents, and so, um, so we did put a GPS tracker on uh, halfway through the year, and it just allowed us to sleep a lot easier. So, it, you know, it was just a small off-the-shelf unit. Um, it was independent of all the other power sources on the buoy communications. So, and it worked really well for us. Um, okay, how long do you plan to operate this system? Like, what are your plans for 2012? Well, the buoy is definitely going out uh, next year. Uh, we've been working uh, with with the Cook Plan on this. This is, you know, definitely a priority for them now. Um, you know, they've had a lot of good good relationships with the local community, and so I think this 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 will continue. They do plan to continue it. They've, you know, own all the equipment, um, and so we just have to put it out again every year. So it should be so it should be out there for years to come, but definitely this year. Thanks, Ed. And now I want to introduce um, Sarah Maples she's from Gloss, and she's going to be talking about DMAC. 
Thank you, Kathy. And first, I'm going to provide an overview of the Great Lakes Observing System, the organization, and also our role in the Great Lakes. Then I'll talk about the need and the value of a fully integrated binational observing system, the, the users that benefit, and then briefly talk about a few of our data management services. In March 2000, 2009, Congress passed the Omnibus Public Land Management Act, a bill that includes legislation that would develop the Integrated Ocean Observing System, or IUS, as part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This legislation named NOAA the lead agency in developing uh, IUS and coordinates with 16 other federal agencies. IUS fills that vital role of uh, tracking, predicting, managing, and also adapting to changes in the ocean coasts and Great Lakes to help ensure safety of citizens, unlock economic benefits, and also protect the environment for generations to come. IUS has regional bodies, of which GLOSS is the Great Lakes node, to help coordinate and integrate observing system components on a local and also regional scale. GLOSS is the Great Lakes representative within the larger context of national and international observing systems, or the region's advocate, if you will. GLOSS is an independent entity, and although we do receive federal funding, it's through a com competitive basis, and we are registered as a nonprofit agency. GLOSS envisions, like I said, this fully integrated binational observing system that provides products and services to decision makers, resource managers, and also other data users to inform decision making. We envision an observing system that can sense, compile, evaluate, integrate, communicate, and also store information on the physical, chemical, and biological conditions of coastal lands and waters of the Great Lakes, helping decision makers make informed, short, and also long-term decisions. By meeting these data and information needs in the region, the Great Lakes Observing System can help save lives, protect property, reduce illness, improve efficiencies, provide better long-term monitoring, management, restoration, and sustainability of the Great Lakes Basin. In order to reach this larger vision for the Great Lakes, we work within four main subsystems. Through our outreach efforts, we coordinate users, collectors, and providers of Great Lakes data at various scales to identify the needs for data, information, and products, identify gaps, and also avoid duplication. We represent the Great Lakes in a global community that establishes technology standards to improve data management and exchange. And we enhance the region's network of observing and monitoring activities. And you can see on the slide um, our current activities. You've heard from uh, two of the people today that we work with at the U of M and also Michigan Tech, but I should also um, mention that we work with the State University of New York, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, the University of Minnesota Duluth, uh, NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, and also the Cooperative Institute of Limnology and Ecosystem Research. And we also provide data services to support the needs of uh, Great Lakes modeling and uh, other tools and products. In order to address these information needs, we work through, I like to think of it as four different lenses, uh, our focus areas, ecosystem health, maritime operations, public health and water security, and also climate change adaptation. The Great Lakes Observing System is a complete and really interwoven system that comprises equipment, software, data, and process information. The collection of all these elements into a single system is shown in this slide. As you can see on the left, sensing observations are ultimately translated into data and information products and tools needed by a broad number of users. As you can see, this, this is a huge range from recreational butters and fishermen, the shipping industry, emergency response teams, planners, uh, fisheries managers, municipal water suppliers, beach managers, and also industries. As many of us know, there's a lot of challenges associated with collecting data, making it reliable, accessible, quality assured, and also relevant to users. GLOSS provides a framework for connecting multiple data collectors, data providers, and also data users to develop standards, protocols, processes, and information technology to advance data management, observations, modeling, and technology in the Great Lakes in order to meet these user needs. 
On a local or regional scale, within the Great Lakes Observing System, your organization may play multiple roles. You could data collector, data interpreter, decision maker, modeler, resource manager. GLOSS works with government agencies on the local, state, federal level, as well as tribal associations, academic researchers, NGOs, and communities in both the U.S. and Canada. And all of these groups play multiple roles within the GLOSS system. GLOSS essentially provides a bridge between users and providers within four main subcategories. For example, when GLOSS and NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory partnered to, de to design a pollution spill model of the uh, St. Clair River, modelers recommended a three-dimensional hydraulic model that would calculate velocities along the direction of flow uh, vertically and from bank to bank. They argued that only a 3D model could uh, correctly track the movements of pollutants. But Gloss had a different, heard a different view when it held a workshop with the water utility managers along the St. Clair that might actually use this information from the model to track spills. The managers said that there were already models of the river, but none that had been designed from their own perspective. They needed proof that the models could predict the movements of spills before they could base decisions on it. The managers noted that the model first suggested would take hours to run on a supercomputer, too slow for spill response, and the managers were interested in the movement of the pollutants, which could be different from the movement of water because of different specific gravities. Gloss and the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory did develop a 3D model, but tested it with dye spills of different specific gra gravities. The model was run for a, a wide range of different conditions, and the results cr uh, used to create graphs that managers could use during actual emergencies. GLOSS has several data management and modeling products that are available on our website, and two are shown on this slide are the Observations Explorer and the Data Catalog. On the upper left, the Observations Explorer provides real-time and historic data from across the Great Lakes, including lake conditions, water levels, wave heights, air and water temperatures. And through the data catalog on the bottom right, users are able to access data served by GLOSS and provide links to non-GLOSS data sources. Users can retrieve custom subsets from some of the data based on time, location, measurement type, and data source. And in, in addition to accessing data, additional information is available on each of the data sets on a summary page. Limnotech is our new data management contractor, and we're working on developing a new data portal that integrates our data management services into a common system to streamline data access and download. We're really excited about the direction of our new data management services, and uh, you can look forward to that in the coming year. All of our tools and services are publicly available on the GLOSS website. If you have data that you'd like to contribute to the GLOSS system, your data would be available for you and others to view and use on the site. So if you'd like more information about either how to contribute data, how to use the tools on our site, or any of our other activities, um, please feel free to contact us. And with that, thank you. Um, we, did, we had a question about um, some of the other lakes, Lake Erie or Lake Ontario, what might be going on there with people to, um, submitting data to GLOSS. I, I guess I would suggest that the best way to go about that is to go up on our, our website. You can see that through the data catalog we have uh, observations and representation from data all across the Great Lakes. And so, um, yeah, I would suggest go to our website, www.gloss.us. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, next, we're going to have Greg Peterson from Limnotech. He's going to kind of give a final conclusion overview wrap-up. I'd like to thank uh, all of the presenters today, and I'd also like to thank all of you that are participating in the webinar uh, for tuning in today. Um, hopefully, you found the uh, information on the buoys and, and gloss informative. I'm going to speak briefly uh, here about <clears throat> where the buoys and, and, de and the data generated by the buoys uh, fit in the overall context of GLOSS, um, reinforcing uh, some of what uh, Sarah was saying, but also uh, where, where, where we 
uh, are hoping that gloss will be going in the future and also to make a pitch uh, that if you're involved now or in the future in the installation of a real-time uh, data buoy that you, you pro provide that data uh, to the gloss system so that it's available on the web for all potentially in interested users over the past year there was a multi-agency uh, collaborative effort to create a vision uh, concept and uh, near-term design uh, for the expansion of the gloss enterprise the project was funded by Glimpo under a GLRI grant uh, managed and directed by NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory with intensive participation of, of GLOSS and the other agencies identified on the um, screen. Um, the outcome of that project, uh, which include design reports and an executive summary, are available on our website, and I'll give you a link on the next slide. The concept of th this particular slide shows the concept of operations. Um, and uh, for a fully established but continually improving observing system. The centerpiece of the system is the data management and communication system, or DMAC, and that's what Sarah was uh, dis discussing that we're currently working with uh, Gloss on. Um, that DMAC is up and running. Uh, we are working on improvements to that and uh, expansions of that. But it serves as the central nervous system uh, for the observations, receiving the data from the various sensors that are in place across the Great Lakes and provides that data to the user uh, community, uh, as uh, Sarah showed you. Um, it is envisioned that with interagency oversight, GLOSS will continue through outreach to understand the evolving user needs, as pictured there on the left, um, convey those needs uh, to the research community, the Great Lakes researchers, sensor technology develop developers, etc., who will continue to develop research and technologies to meet those needs and expand and continuously improve the implementation of the observations of the physical, chemical, and biological conditions in the Great Lakes. The implementation of the near-term design for the expansion of the observing system architecture is envisioned to occur over three different scales, meeting different uh, objectives and, and user needs. At the basin-wide scale, it is envisioned that a basic level of sensing will be distributed throughout the Great Lakes, and, and for the most part, it's largely there, providing fundamental physical uh, data to meet user needs that are common across the, all the lakes and, and are broad in scale, such as meteorological data, water temperature, wave height, etc. Effort will also be expended and is currently being expended on the further development and improvement of the DMAC backbone. Um, and we're hoping that it's going to facilitate the dissemination of the ever-growing uh, information. We envision the build-out of this infrastructure to be similar to the creation of the uh, interstate expressways. Uh, being federally funded, much like the uh, interstate highways were, um, but then allowing for uh, the, the creation, development, and connection of uh, local roadways uh, that would be uh, consistent with uh, the uh, more regional scale type observations of the uh, observing sail system. At the lake scale, the second scale that, we, that the de uh, design was created for, we envision the specific components of the observing system to be, be developed to meet the lake-specific scientific and community needs. Each of the lakes are different. They're facing different issues. The types of sensors and the types of parameters that are being measured are different for each of the, 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 the different uh, lakes. And then at the regional scale, we're already seeing lakeshore communities installing sensors to address a variety of site-specific information needs, um, as has been talked about in the past presentations, uh, from wave and water temperature sensing for recreational boaters uh, to water intake monitoring, et cetera. We expect that more and more shoreline communities and industries will see the value of the real-time sensing and that the network will continue to expand and grow as a result. So the uh, story that Ed told you about our experience this uh, past year with the real-time uh, buoy for the Lake Michigan Power Plant, Cook Power Plant, uh, is uh, depicted 
um, and, and kind of taught us a lesson that, um, and, and, I, and uh, supports a pitch I'm about to make, which is um, this particular diagram and, and that particular uh, experience just showed uh, the explosion of user interest uh, and, and the explosion of, of uh, additional needs that were met. Um, when we put that data that typically in the past would be uh, reserved for internal use and, and only for the power company's need when we put that data up on the internet. You know, so rather than just collecting the data and keeping that information to themselves, the power company supported making that real-time data uh, available to the public through the U of M website and the uh, National Data Buoy Center. And as, De as Ed was telling you, within days of going live, we found that a number of different users were accessing the real-time data from surfers to sports fishermen and recreational boaters to the National Weather Service. So just by providing access to the data from the Internet, we found that the utility of the information that was collected expanded exponentially. Build it and they will come, as Ed said. So we encourage all of you that have the opportunity to include real-time sensors in your studies or as part of your ongoing monitoring programs to connect to the GLOSS system. So the present sensing capabilities of, of the existing system are, are very powerful and reliable and are continuing to improve and expand in the types of parameters uh, that can be collected. The costs for the information are reasonable and the economic benefits provided are ever growing. As the technologies continue to improve, it is expected that the types of information that can be collected and the utility of the systems will expand and unit costs will decrease. Much of the system is available and in place. Stations in open water support lake-wide reports and forecasts. There are gaps in the nearshore areas supplemented by the model results, um, but uh, as, we, as the user community grows, we're expecting that the demand will open up opportunities uh, for shared and collaborative uh, funding so that what, we are now be, what, what are now being deployed by a, a small uh, group of researchers will be supported in part by local communities as well so that that there's shared funding and that the complementary needs of uh, the different users are met. And we're, we're uh, envisioning that uh, with this broad community uh, support uh, from uh, and meeting the various different objectives that uh, there's going to be opportunity for the shared funding that will then lead to a, a sustainable sensing system. It won't be simply individuals going out installing these buoys only to meet their needs. So <laughs> thank you again uh, to all the, the speakers um, and, and thanks again to the participants. We're very interested in your feedback as well as continuing the discussions and, and your ongoing participation. Much like the expansion of the Internet, we envision that the build out of the Great Lakes Observing System will be a Great Lakes community effort with ever-expanding content provided by many over time. We're confident that the expanding connections and sharing of information will benefit all in the Great Lake User Committee and a Community and will serve to improve the management, restoration, and enjoyment of this vital region and resource. Thank you, Greg. Um, we're, we do have time for um, some questions. Um, so I think I'll start with a few quick questions for Sarah. Yeah, just a quick question. Sorry. Um, there's a couple quick questions. Does GLASS have plans to incorporate U um, USGS data? And are you interested in grab sample data or only continuous data? Well, we do actually have some USGS data already uh, incorporated into our site. We have the stream gauges, and uh, yes, uh, we definitely have plans to uh, incorporate more of USGS data into the future. Um, in terms of uh, grab sample data or only continuous data, I think you know our our goal 
if, if there's a lot of uh, kind of grab and go data, that can oftentimes uh, help out the system quite a bit because it, it really feeds into this idea of this larger system. So yes, we are interested um, in both types of data. Okay, great, thanks. Okay. Um, We've had a, a several questions related uh, related to the mooring system for the buoys. So, um, Dr. Meadows, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, some more specific details about your mooring system, and maybe uh, talk a little bit more about some of the issues that you had with tangling, and when um, you know they when when they became uh, loose. <laughs> sure, there, there's a whole series of questions that deal with mooring, so maybe I can knock off a bunch of them at once. We've taken the philosophy that to keep costs down that we'd like to design a mooring system that we can remove and replace the buoy uh, in the remove in the fall and replace in the spring with small boat operations, so something on the order of a 25-foot boat. So what we do is we drop a 2,000-pound uh, concrete mooring block uh, with a chain leader uh, and sufficient mooring line and we use primarily nylon line three quarters to an inch in, in diameter with enough of that scope so that it comes all the way to the surface. We drop that with a small tugboat or some, some feature like that. We drop it once and we leave it on the bottom uh, for each repetitive year. We then can tow the buoy from just any launch ramp with the small boat and the trailer that you saw Don Wire describe. Uh, out to the location, connect that to the mooring line, um, and drop the whole mess into the water. Um, then in, again in the, in the fall, uh, we, with the use of a tag line down to the base of the thermistor, we pull that back to the surface, disconnect the buoy, tow it back to shore, and stretch the mooring line out on the bottom, and leave it stored over the winter on the bottom. We then grapple for it again in the springtime. Uh, that system has worked extremely well for us. We've had no problems in finding the moorings and getting them back up to the surface. Um, the, there was a question about permits. Yes, a permit is required, actually three of them. Uh, one from the State of Michigan, Department of Environmental Quality, one from the Corps of Engineers, and one from the U.S. Coast Guard. The two federal permits are combined. That's a one-stop operation. Uh, MDEQ is usually the starting point in Michigan for the permit. Um, and you need to have a rep riparian, a, a landowner on the water uh, to sponsor that. University of Michigan does not own any land on Lake Michigan, uh, therefore the local community served as that riparian for us, and that, that worked out very well. Um, what went wrong is, uh, and it only happened this year, up until this year, starting in Lake St. Clair in 2006, we've had no mooring problems, but for this year, as Ed indicated, the buoys did dance around the mooring all in the same way, counterclockwise, until they wrapped up the leader chain and wrapped up this very long uh, mooring cable uh, until they chafed on the edge of the buoys. And as engineers, we were not as clever as we should have been. It's uh, very easy to cast a 2,000-pound uh, cubicle type of mooring block with sharp edges. We are now replacing those with a mushroom-shaped anchor that doesn't have edges and no place for that mooring line to catch on. And again, the unusually long mooring line is the result of wanting them to be able to leave the mooring on the bottom and be able to disconnect the mooring without using divers or any, uh, any complicated operations in the fall that actually reaches all the way to the surface. So the buoy has a fairly large watch circle that it penetrates in. Um, one more. The buoys, you're only putting the buoys out during, um, you know, spring to fall. They're not, you're not able to do that in the winter, right? Right. The, even the, the large million dollar a piece NDBC buoys cannot survive typical Great Lakes winters. So unfortunately, all the buoys come in as late in the season as we're comfortable with leaving them there. Um, this season, we could have probably gotten away with them still being out there. It's been a very, very <laughs> unusual year. Um, but yes, we do sacrifice the winter data. We're working on clever ways to get around that, but some of the most interesting science occurs during the very severe late fall and winter seasons, and we're sorry we missed that, but the buoys just will not survive that type of, of, uh, of environment. And part of the issue is 
the buoy motions, how the buoy bobs in the water is how we sense the waves. And as ice accumulates on the buoy and the mass of the buoy changes, that changes our ability to accurately measure the waves and a number of other things. Great. Thank you. I have a couple questions for Ed. Um, how, how often did you maintain your buoy and maybe talk a little bit about the battery? Uh, sure. Um, for our buoy, we put it in June and uh, because it has solar panels on it, the, those uh, charge the internal batteries. And our uh, power balance um, you know, is such that we don't need to come back and recharge the batteries or replace them at all. So the, so the charge lasted all year, um, and so we didn't have to service it at all. So we put it in in, in June, and we took it out in October. Um, this, this next year, we're going to put it in earlier in, you know, in um, hopefully mid-March and take it out in October. So they're designed to be you know, um, to, to, to not be serviced throughout the year unless something comes up. Um, if you start hanging or, or start putting like a water quality sensor on it um, that has some calibration requirements, that might change your service frequency. So all of the instruments we have uh, are just more of the physical measurements, don't, don't require any service uh, throughout the year. Oh. Have you ever, has your buoy ever been hit by a boat? It's never been hit by a boat. There are, there are lights on it, there's a radar reflector on it. Uh, so uh, the boaters know there's also, you know, the notice to mariners that goes out. Um, and a guy was just saying that he did have one <laughs> one boater hit hit theirs. You know, the one thing, you know, these buoys are kind of cool looking, and so people have a tendency to want to get close to them. Um, and so, you know, if anyone's out there and sees these, uh, please stay, you know, hundreds of feet away that there's a mooring line down there, um, and please don't tie up to them. <laughs> tie up to them. Um, one quick question for Don. Have you sold any of these um, buoy systems outside of the Great Lakes? Uh, I mentioned that we have uh, a, a production batch getting ready to start. We, we like to build them in batches, and, and typically it's been um, four to six at a time. Um, I have a client in this next batch that is committed to two buoys that he'll be doing some uh, work in Alaska. Um, so those will be the, the furthest away yet and uh, we've done some special accommodations for his research, um, so we're very excited about that. But the buoy is intended to, to work in any, any coastal environment. Um, corrosion and so on is, uh, are all topics that we're very familiar with and, um, and designed the buoy with all those things in mind. So it's, it's not just a lake buoy, it just happens to have a lot of fans in the Great Lakes Basin. <laughs> okay, good. Um, our last question, will be for Greg if he could give us a few comments on cost. Okay, well the, the cost of, of deploying and maintaining the buoys is going to depend a lot on what the parameters are that you're and, and what your specific uh, uh, sensing uh, requirements are for your project. Uh, you know, for the, uh, it, we, we saw uh, ranges from, you know, 10 to uh, over a hundred thousand um, dollars in the, the buoys that we looked at, um, the the buoys that were talked about today typically were in the forty to eighty thousand uh, dollar capital cost range, um, and then you know the the maintenance requirements depend entirely on on, on your schedule, and, and as Ed was saying, would depend then upon what kind of parameters you were monitoring for. So, it, it, it the cost is really sensitive to the type of equipment if you're going to uh, hang a ADCP. For example, well, that adds twenty thousand um, dollars, and that's where you get into the eighty thousand dollar kind of range for the buoys. Okay, great, thank you. Um, that's going to do it for the webinar. I want to thank everyone again for joining us. We hope this has been informative. The slides will be available. We're going to email the slides out on Monday, with also a link to the recording of of the webinar. Um, when you sign off, there's a quick um, survey. I think it's a couple questions, two or three. We'd really appreciate it if you just take a second to let us know if you found this helpful. Um, and then any of the remaining questions, we will be as emailing answers to those questions. So thank you again, and that's it.